Thank you for joining us today for this month's From My Point of View program. Today we're fortunate and honored to have with us Mr. Michael Wallace, a longtime friend, collaborator, and supporter of Gilcrease Museum. It has been said that reading a Michael Wallace book is like dancing to a romantic ballad. He offers his hand and gently guides you across the floor, swaying to the song of the American West. A best-selling author and award-winning reporter, Michael is a historian and biographer of the American West who has garnered international attention as a speaker and voice talent. Michael's distinctive voice was featured in Cars, a popular 2006 animated film from Pixar Studios. In 2016, Michael received an Emmy Award for his work in the documentary film Boomtown, a storyteller who likes nothing better than transporting audiences across time and space, Michael has published 16 books, including Route 66, The Mother Road, a book credited with sparking a resurgence of interest in the lore and history of the highway. Two of Michael's recent works include Davy Crockett, The Lion of the West, and The Wild West 365, both published in 2011. Michael's latest book, The Best Land Under Heaven, The Donner Party in the Age of Manifest Destiny, was published in June 2017 and is the subject of today's talk. The book became an instant bestseller and is already in its third printing. Michael's writing has appeared in hundreds of national and international magazines and newspapers, including Time, Life, People, Smithsonian, The New Yorker, and The New York Times. He has been nominated three times for the Pulitzer Prize and was also a nominee for the National Book Award. Michael is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Will Rogers Spirit Award, the Western Heritage Award from the National Cowboy Hall and Western Heritage Museum, and the Oklahoma Book Award from the Oklahoma Center for the Book, the Best Western Nonfiction Award from the Western Writers of America, the Errol Gibson Lifetime Achievement Award, the Lynn Riggs Award, and the first John Steinbeck Award. Michael was inducted into the Writers Hall of Fame of America, the M Missouri Writers Hall of Fame, the Oklahoma Professional Writers Hall of Fame, the Oklahoma Historians Hall of Fame, and the Tulsa Hall of Fame. Michael and his wife Suzanne Fitzgerald Wallace have lived in Tulsa since 1982. His compelling bestseller, The Best Land Under Heaven, The Donner Party in the Age of Manifest Destiny, is available for purchase in the museum store, and he will be signing copies following this talk and Q&A session. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Michael Wallace. You know, I knew this was going to be a noon event, and I think there was some something said about some people might bring bag lunches or something. I don't see any, which is too bad because there's no better lunch and talk <laughs> than the Donner Party. <laughs> Maybe you're waiting. <laughs> I've been giving the same presentation ever since May 25th when we started, even before publication, the tour. That was an event at the Tulsa Historical Society. And since then, I've been all over the country uh, giving this same presentation to audiences that were just marvelous from coast to coast. And I, I was very fortunate that early on, the reviewers, especially the important reviewers, the trade reviewers, Publishers Weekly, Kirk, and so forth, and the big literary reviewers, the New York Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, Wall Street Journal, etc., seized on this book and they got it. They fully understood my intent was to tell the complete story of the Donners. And that's what I'm just going to share a little bit with you now, and then we'll visit about this great episode in American history. 
But I'm always glad to be back at Yoke Creek, and it's so appropriate because this is the last official event of the tour. <laughs> and here I am with fellow lovers of literature and history, the American West, and I hope lovers of stories told bold and true. Now, a bit of business. Although I was a crack shot more than a half century past while serving as a U.S. Marine infantryman, I no longer have any need nor desire to possess a gun. Had enough of them. However, with that said, it is so important that today, in this great Vista room, in this building that contains so much of the DNA of the West, that I take up, if you will, an imaginary weapon and shoot squarely in the head the proverbial elephant in this room, and in every room I've spoken in. Cannibalism. <clears throat> Considered the ultimate abomination, just the mere thought of cannibalism brings up horrific images. Along with incest and bestiality, it's one of the great cultural taboos. So that is why, naturally, when people hear the words, the Donner Party, cannibalism is predictably the first thing that comes to mind. Ask most people if they've ever heard of the Donner Party, and if they have, they invariably reply with something like, Oh, the Donner Party, weren't those the pioneers who got trapped in a blizzard in the mountains and ended up eating each other? It is true that if not for the acts of survival cannibalism, the Donner Party would have been a mere footnote. One of the many wagon caravans of settlers that crossed over the high Sierras of California, but that simply was not the case. It is indisputable that some members of the snowbound Donner Party, in order to survive, did in fact resort to cannibalism of the dead that dreadful winter of 1846-1847. And as a result, basic human curiosity and the lure of the morbid have always drawn people to this story. I, I venture possibly it comes from a yearning to empathize with someone else's suffering. Or maybe, maybe the enticement of death causes one to feel truly alive. And some may find nourishment in the darkness. Rick Burns, that incredible documentary filmmaker, put it quite well when he said, the cannibalism becomes like the barker outside the tent. It's what helps you bring people into the story, but you end up telling them a story once inside that's actually quite different from that that the barker has led people to believe, which is a story of really a kind of infinite pain and sorrow, and not a story really of immorality or ghoulishness at all, but a story of suffering and stoicism and survival in the face of adversity. It is a story that certainly ended for those who perished in the snowy mountains, but for others it was but the beginning of a new life. The fact is that survivors desperate and delirious from starvation and hypothermia were forced to consume the flesh of the dead out of sheer necessity. But that's only, that's only a part of the story, obviously a major part of the story, but there is and there always has been and it's been neglected so much more. No matter if they lived or died Everyone who was part of that journey were forever guaranteed a place in the annals of American history. Among the more than 300,000 people in the mid-1800s who, 
and the words of that old treasured frontier saying, we're willing to cross heaven to get to the promised land of California and Oregon. No single wagon train garnered as much attention as the one that ultimately became known as the Downer Party. Their travels and travails are considered the best documented and famous of all the pioneer narratives. Yet, their story has always been snarled in myth, exaggeration, and often outright lies. This book, I am pleased to tell you, tells the complete story and not just the obvious. This is a story of that band of people with no Moses or Joshua to lead them and their request to remake themselves in a new place on the distant edge of the continent. This is a story of missed opportunities and unspeakable horrors as well as realized dreams and human triumph. It is full of what ifs, maybes, could have beens, and if onlys. It tells of how they died, but also, more importantly, it's a story of who they were and how they lived and how they came to end up in the predicament that haunted the survivors the rest of their lives. So then this story symbolizes both America's westward expansion and the frontier foundation myth. It's the story of the foibles and sheer follies of Manifest Destiny, the widely held belief that the United States had been visited by God Almighty above and the Eastern Anglos were told that they had the right, they were chosen to embark on a mission to expand, to conquer, to spread their form of government and way of life across the continent. The movement's name came from a catchphrase. John L. O'Sullivan, a New York publisher, coined this rallying cry in an editorial in the July-August 1845 issue of the Democrat Republic when he proclaimed, when he proclaimed that it was by the right of our manifest destiny to overspread and to possess the whole of the continent which providence has given us for the development of the great experiment of liberty. And that, my friends, is why the Donner story is relevant today as we now witness similar attitudes invaluable lessons of history, as always, being ignored, and the sins of the past repeated. And this is what the critics and now the readers have seized upon, that then as now we see the danger of the lethal combination of ignorance and arrogance, a frightening reminder of what could be. This is also a story that has been told and retold as both gospel truth and campfire yarns. And like most good stories, it has changed with each telling. But now, it was my turn. And my story begins with the land. It starts on the endless prairie carpet and the rich soil beneath that was the flesh of the earth. In April 1846, a company of expatriates, the early foot soldiers of manifest destiny that came to be commonly known as the Donner Reed Party, departed Springfield, Illinois, headed for the Mexican province of Alta, California. Like so many more to come, they were also inspired to head west by the promise of a richer life offered by America's grand expansionist movement. The America they were leaving behind in 1846 was a nation of some 20 million people, including Indians and others held in bondage as slaves. Plantations and farms still predominated, but the 
fast pace of growth was transforming the landscape, the surge of cities, the stirring of industry, and the rush of transportation and commerce marked those times. There was no holding America back in 1846. The nation was fixated on extending its borders, no matter who was in the way. It was a watershed year. Bernard DeVoto would later call it the year of decision. And indeed it was, and not all the decisions proved wise. America was changing from a struggling new nation into the new bully on the block. The sovereign nation of Texas was annexed the year before and became a slave state. America wanted more, present-day California, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, and Utah. So the nation, led by the bellicose and land-hungry President James K. Polk, known by his peers to be single-minded and fanatical in the purpose of acquiring the West, went to war with Mexico. And before it ended, the United States lost 2,000 men in action and 12,000 more to disease, but we got all that land. Some political leaders, such as Abraham Lincoln, the wise new Whig congressman from Illinois and a friend of members of the Donner Party, believed the content of the country's national character was changed and for the worse. But some of Lincoln's acquaintances in Springfield did not share those feelings. As more than a million starving refugees from Ireland's potato blights and killing famine came to America, thousands of Americans experienced a different sort of hunger. Theirs was an appetite for land, an opportunity, a wave of people including that band of citizens who gathered in Springfield, was eager to become part of what they thought would be a grand adventure. The Donner Party's collective dream, however, morphed into a collective nightmare, when because of poor timing, terrible advice, and even worse weather, only part of those who started the journey reached their final destination. After becoming snowbound in the Sierra Nevada mountains near the border of present-day Nevada and California, the party soon ran out of food and ultimately, ultimately resorted to feeding off the flesh of their dead companions and family members in order to survive. So again, this aspect of the Donner Party comes up and it's what does make it so grotesquely fascinating and still one of the most haunting to come out of the settlement of the West, and why it continues to loom large in American folklore. The Donner Party's fate, while chasing both their golden fantasy and America's continental dream, highlighted the ambitiousness, the folly, the recklessness, and often the ruthlessness that was spawned by Manifest Destiny. So in this way then, the Donner Party becomes a metaphor for manifest destiny and a microcosm of the United States, which at the time, while busily consuming other nations, Mexico and many, many Indian tribes standing in the way of Western migration, had the potential to consume itself. It's, it's truly a gothic tale. Set on the American frontier, and it draws a real parallel between individuals consuming flesh and the desire of a country to consume the continent. In truth, this party of trail-weary pioneers became victims of their own ambitions. There are so many reasons why the story of the Donners is a tale of tragedy and misfortune. But one explanation that has been mostly ignored is the fact that members of this ill-fated group lost all notion of their sense of place. Like the multitudes that soon followed their path, the Donner Party believed that the West would become 
the most American part of America. So that's to say the part where those features that distinguish America from Europe come out in the strongest relief. Decades after the drama of Adonis played out, British historian Lord James Bryce observed, the West may be called the most distinctly American part of America because the points in which it differs from the East are the points in which America as a whole differs from Europe. That statement perfectly fits the members of the Donner Party. Yet perhaps my old pal Wallace Stegner, who died too soon in my beloved Santa Fe some years back, said it best. And it's, they're words that I've never forgotten and have taken into my heart. Stegner said, no place is a place until things that have happened in it are remembered in history, in ballads, in yarns, in legends, or monuments. History was part of the baggage we threw overboard when we launched ourselves in the new world. We threw it away because it recalled old tyrannies, old limitations, galling obligations, and bloody memories. So plunging into the future through a landscape that had not history, we did the country and ourselves some harm, along with the good. The personal motives of the immigrants varied. Some planned to build permanent homes or farms, but others hoped to make or enhance their fortunes and return east. Some of the younger single men saw the journey into the unknown as the adventure of a lifetime. The bulk of the Donner Party, however, was comprised of people who left the country of their fathers to dwell in the land they sincerely believed their children were destined to inherit. They were living examples of those who live in the future and make their country as they go along. Often, too often, the voices of the Downer Party survivors were and still are not heard because people continue to ignore what those voices actually said. Again, I can't stress enough, there's so much more to the story than the oft-told and interpreted tales of death and cannibalism. The legend of these people is a long and complex story of how a group of individuals and families from varied backgrounds, stratified in age and wealth and education and ethnicity, headed west following their different dreams. And out of necessity, they were made to unite and battle against the unknown, weather, nature, and finally, life and death. If not for a few wrong turns, the choice of bad directions, and a winter storm the likes of which had never been seen, the Donner Party would have been an unremarkably successful wagon train. But as it happened, it became a lesson of what can happen when everything goes wrong, a cautionary tale of manifest destiny and an unforgettable calamity. Their story collectively becomes one of courage and cowardice, madness and murder, love and hate and survival. They found that in pursuing what came to be known as the American dream, sometimes, sometimes nightmares are the consequence. And now my good friends, I'll share with you a few spoonfuls from the Donner <laughs> This first is an excerpt from a chapter very early in the book, Queen City of the Trails, May 10th to 12th, 1846. 
On May 10, 1846, the Donna Reed wagons rolled into the bustling Jackson County seat of Independence, Missouri. It was a Sabbath, and no doubt prayers of thanksgiving were raised. At last, after 25 days of travel, they had arrived at the place where they believed their grand adventure would start. Beginning with the Lewis and Clark expedition in 1804, Missouri played a key role in westward expansion. Fur trappers and traders helped St. Louis become known as the gateway to the west. St. Charles, St. Joseph, Westport, later part of Kansas City, also became popular starting points for immigrants who settled that great expanse between Missouri and the Pacific. Yet independence deserved special credit for Missouri having earned its distinctive moniker, Mother of the West. It was a matter of geography. Founded in 1827, a few miles from the south bank of the Missouri River, at the farthest point where steamboats could navigate, independence became the epicenter of Western migration. Typically, wagon trains did not leave until about the middle of May, when there was enough green grass to provide pasturage for draft animals. The original town site was the eastern terminus for three principal trails, the Santa Fe, Oregon, and California. That was why Independence had a sober kept all its own, Queen City of the Trails. Chief among the caravan's supporters was James Maxey, James Reed's Masonic brother who ran a general store in Independence. Maxey and his business partner, William S. Stone, were delighted to sell fresh goods to familiar faces. Lee Reed later noted that Maxie and Stone treated us like as if we were brothers. When the wagon caravan reached Independence's public square, the immigrants were astounded by what they beheld. They were assaulted by the smells of toiling men and overworked beasts, fresh manure, tobacco, and wood smoke, and many exotic aromas they could not place. The dirt streets teemed with people speaking a cacophony of languages, accents, and dialects, Spanish, German, Italian, and various Indian languages, including Osage, Kaw, Choctaw, and Chickasaw. The town of Independence was at this time a great babel upon the border of the wilderness, was how immigrant Jesse Quinn Thornton described independence in May 1846. Thornton and his wife were eager to leave the United States and move to what was soon to become Oregon Territory. He had been practicing law and editing a newspaper in Palmyra, Missouri. Because of their staunch abolitionist views, Thornton and his wife left pro-slavery Missouri in 1841 and moved across the Mississippi to Quincy, Illinois, where he continued his work as a lawyer. Thornton corresponded regularly with influential newspaper editor Horace Greeley and maintained a close friendship with Senator Thomas Hart Benton and with Stephen A. Douglas, former Conrad and political rival of Abraham Lincoln. On April 18th, 1846, just a few days after the Donna Reed party left Springfield, Thornton and his infirm wife set out for independence with their noble greyhound, Prince Darko, and two young hired men to handle the wagon. Most of the immigrants had already departed, Thornton wrote in his trail diary. Some were assembled at Indian Creek. A few were still in this place, not yet prepared to depart. Among these, I became acquainted with Messrs. James F. Reed, George Donner, and Jacob Donner, together with their wives and families, all from the neighborhood of Springfield, Illinois, and all of whom proposed to go to California. Thornton told the Donner brothers and Reed that he was waiting for a few other immigrants to arrive and expected to move on within the hour. He also urged them to get going as soon as possible and join his party 
on the trail where an even larger caravan awaited them on the Kaw River. Thornton's advice made good sense. They agreed that they would all meet again soon. Then the Donner and Reed parties continued their inspection of independence. The panorama was nothing like they had ever seen on the public square in Springfield. Besides the many immigrant wagon trains, several sizable trading caravans from Chihuahua, Mexico had just arrived after 46 days on the Santa Fe Trail. After three weeks on the trail, the Donner and Reed children were especially excited. Among those in independence who took notice of the Donner Reed Party's arrival was Francis Parkman, a 23-year-old Harvard Law graduate from a wealthy Boston family. Parkman was starting a two-month adventure that he described as a tour of curiosity and amusement to the Rocky Mountains. <clears throat> Destined to become one of the nation's preeminent historians, as a result of his experiences in the American West, Parkman published in 1849 The Oregon Trail, Sketches of Prairie and Rocky Mountain Life. This book, despite its misleading title, since Parkman's excursions took him only along the first third of the Oregon Trail, inspired many people to move westward and had a profound impact on generations of readers. The clamor of the town square was enough to give Margaret Reed one of her crippling migraines. Fortunately, the party's campsite was not far away at the public spring on the east side of Independence. For as long as anyone could remember, the many springs in this area had provided potable water for roaming bands of Indians and any travelers who dared venture into the land. By sunrise on May 12th, the Donna Reed camp was stirring. Gershom Keyes bid his ailing mother and sister farewell. He and George Donner's son William had ridden with the company all the way from Springfield, and now it was almost time for them to go home. They would ride with the wagon a ways and then head east to Illinois. The departure from Independence was emblazoned in the memories of many members of the party. As we drove up Main Street, delayed immigrants weighed us a lighthearted goodbye, recalled Eliza Donner. And as we approached the building of the American Tract Society, its agent came to our wagons and put into the hand of each child a New Testament and gave to each adult a Bible and also tracts to distribute among the heathen in the benighted land to which we were going. Near the outskirts of town, we parted from William Donner, took a last look at independence, turned our backs to the morning sun, and became pioneers indeed to the far west. This next spoonful comes from much later in the book. Snowbound, November. 1846. Death no longer startled the Donner Party, but it continued to stalk them in California. Now death tracked them from the Gulf of Alaska, ringed by mountains, forests, and tidewater glaciers that spilled onto the coastal plains. As clouds grew and low pressure Strengthened, the jet stream was forced south along the coastline. Clouds loaded with moisture rolled over sea and shore. The storm punched to the east, cascading over the coastal ranges. It climbed the high Sierras as moist air inside the clouds rose and cooled. The temperature was below freezing, changing the moisture to icy droplets that hardened into crystals. The crystals soon turned into snowflakes in a furious tempest that produced the heaviest snowfalls. 
One such storm would have made the crossing over the Sierras challenging but possible. That was not the case in the autumn of 1846. Starting on October 16th, much earlier in the season than usual, a large snowstorm struck the Sierras. Another big storm soon followed. Between mid-October and early April 1847, 10 major snowstorms descended on the Sierras. Each storm brought huge snowfalls. It was almost November when the first two parties, almost two-thirds of the company, approached Truckee Lake, later renamed Donner Lake. Carved by glaciers and called the gem of the Sierras, the lake was slightly less than three miles long and about three-quarters of a mile wide. Fed by snow melt and numerous creeks and springs, the lake was at the foot of the east flank of the Sierras, an almost vertical, massive wall of smoothly rounded granite boulders. To enter the Promised Land, the immigrants had to ascend more than 7,000 feet to Fremont Pass. Sutter's Fort was less than 90 miles away. The remnants of an early snowfall remained, but the immigrants, most of them lowlanders, were confident that it would not last. They had experienced plenty of snowstorms, even blizzards, where they came from in the Midwest. They knew that after a few days, the snow and ice always melted, and the sky cleared until the next storm. But Weather systems in Illinois, Missouri, or Kentucky were not the same as in the high Sierras, where fierce storms could come in rapid succession and with a vengeance. Now just one more. It's short and sweet. It's the prologue of the book, Donner Lake. June 8th, 1918. On an unseasonably hot Thursday morning below the crest of the Sierra Nevadas, just west of Truckee, California, in a valley sculpted by ancient glaciers, a crowd of 3,500 people gathers for a ceremony to unveil a towering granite monument. The 18-ton bronze statue depicts a pioneer family facing the mountains that need to be crossed before striding boldly into the future. It sits atop a 22-foot tall pedestal, the same height as those winter snows of 1846-1847 that came as silently as a serial killer. On this very ground once stood one of the cabins that sheltered some of the trapped immigrants of what came to be commonly called the Donner Reed Party. The day before, many of those in attendance were treated to a trout banquet and rides around nearby Donner Lake in one of three steamers. Although it was not stated in newspaper reports, many believe this event will help restore the names and reputations of both those who perished and those who survived that terrible winter siege more than 70 years before. <coughs> the audience of dignitaries, area residents, reporters, and visitors from afar now waits for the unveiling of the monument dedicated to the pioneers who crossed the plains to settle in California. There is band music provided by the native sons of the Golden West, followed by speeches from the governors of California and Nevada. Then the onlookers erupt in thunderous applause and cheers when two young girls dressed in white pull the drape off the grand bronze statue. Below the monument, standing with the notables, are special guests of honor three old women wearing their Sunday best. Martha Patty Reed Lewis and sisters Eliza Donner Houghton and Frances Donner Wilder are survivors. <coughs> Seventy years before, they were little girls fighting to stay alive. 
frozen and famished, they huddled together day after day, week after week, for long, hard months while the snow kept coming and almost all hope was gone. They were here when there was no more game, no more oxen or horses to eat. They were here when they and their families devoured mice and chewed on boiled hides and pine cones. Then they ate their pet dogs. Finally, they watched as others cut flesh from the dead and ate members of their families and their friends. Now they are back representing the eight remaining survivors from that horrific time. They gaze far beyond the crowd before them. They look out to where lodgepole pine and white fir poke out of the smooth rock outcrops and the granite bedrock exposed by erosion and time. They see the meadows where buttons, spoons, coins, and bits of bone remain deep in the earth. They do not cry. All their tears are gone, used up over the years while they grew into women and married and had children and then grandchildren. They learned to listen to the ghosts. As the crowd cheers and photographers record the scene, Frances slides her hand into the pocket of her coat. She feels the crackers and bits of peppermint she has always carried morsels of food since the day she was rescued from this place so many years ago. She squeezes the hard candy tight in her fist and she smiles. Thank you. Those of you who brought lunch, did you finish it? <laughs> it's not all that bad. Actually, the wonderful direct descendants of the Donner Party, and there are many of them, have, uh, well, first of all, they're very aware of their heritage and legacy, and they don't pull any punches. Uh, and they all have great senses of humor. I was with several of the Donner descendants one afternoon, talking and visiting, and near the end, of, one of their cousins uh, finally arrived, and they said, be careful of this guy, he'll talk your leg off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's time for questions from what it has to be one of the most intelligent audiences I've <laughs> appeared before. <laughs> Sir? You mentioned the two-story covered wagon. Yes. And I wish you'd put a picture in the book. Of I, it's a, you know, a tiny house on wheels or something like that. I just can't imagine a two-story covered wagon. <laughs> in the well, I, I pictured it in words. There is no, of course, photograph of, of the way, no photographs from that time. What you're referring to is what eventually became known as the Prairie Palace. It wasn't then, it was later, in those post-mortem years of the Downers. But it was a wagon that belonged to the James Reed family. And Reed, who is, in my estimation, probably the most interesting character in the book, uh, devised this grand wagon, mainly for his infirm mother-in-law, who insisted on going with him, knowing that this, the, the trap, the entrapment, the snow aside, just the journey itself, they, they all knew this would kill her, and indeed it did, she was the first one to die. They were barely into what is now Kansas. But it held a huge feather bed for her, and a big cook stove piped up right through to the canvas, the stack, and it was quite something to see. And of course, it didn't even get close to making it to California. It was, it, it was scrapped along with so much of their physical lives and their possessions uh, during that journey. Uh, 
uh, uh, across mountains, streams, deserts. Uh, my goodness, it, it was, you know, just the journey alone, if nothing would have happened, it's tough. But you have to remember that these people were tougher than we are. I mean, I, I think I could put up with a lot, and I've been through a lot, but I'll tell you what. I remember a few years ago, and you all remember it too, that horrible ice storm oh, yeah. okay. that just blitzed it. And Suzanne, my wife, and I are lying in bed on the top of the Sophia Plaza listening to the that horrible sound of the breaking of those old hardwoods, like bones breaking. And, and you know, and then we rally, much like the folks in Texas do. I mean, they're really in a fix. But we rally, and we start having candlelight dinners throughout the Sophian. We keep <coughs> some food and, of course, wine outside, on the outside stairs. But nonetheless, every night, those many nights when we were without electricity and it was cold and it was, it, I, I got that sundowner feeling that you always hear about. The sun's going down, uh, it's quiet as a mausoleum, and I'm putting on lanterns and I'm lighting candles and I'm sitting down with a book and I, it was just utterly depressing and I thought, this is how my great grandfather lived, <laughs> you know. I, so, and I experienced similar feelings in the long time I was out on the trail researching this book, because I put myself in a lot of places where these good folks were. And uh, anyway, it was it, it was a, a real challenge. Yeah, I will repeat the question. Well, you, you kind of ruined it for me because I usually use him as the punchline. <laughs> but I'll tell it anyway. He asked me if I could say something about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln uh, does appear in this book um, because he was a great he was front and center in Sagamon County, Illinois, and in Springfield, the capital of Illinois at that time. Uh, James Reed, this Irish immigrant who came as a boy long before the famine Irish, he came in the early 1800s, and very entrepreneurial, went up uh, into Galena, Illinois, and eventually worked his way up and struck it rich, not on black gold, but on gray gold, uh, lead. He brought his earnings down to Springfield and eventually had a mercantile shop, had a mill out on the Sagamon River. Uh, the little village that grew there was even called Jamestown, or Jimtown, they like to call it. Uh, he was doing quite well, married, Margaret Reed, a very fragile woman, prone, always prone to migraines, and they had this great uh, brood of, of children. But Reed had been greatly damaged financially by the horrible depression of 1837 that really hit a lot of folks uh, uh, of all uh, on all economic levels. And, and Reed, who was pioneering early on railroads, he was a big fan of railroads, he wanted to, 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 to get rails going, and he was even turning out uh, railroad ties from his mill and so forth. Anyway, it looked pretty bad for him. So what he did is he did have... Um, a pretty good uh, cadre of friends, other merchants, uh, some uh, political figures in Springfield, and he had a pretty good um, a young attorney 
And they all got together, and then afterwards, Reed and the attorney got together, and by that time, we're getting into the 1840s, and the writing was on the wall, and he had to declare bankruptcy. But he and his lawyer were able to squirrel away a pretty good bundle of cash. And then the only thing that remained was to, to build up the wagons and get with those the two Donner boys, men, they're in their 60s. Prosperous farmers should have stayed right there. <laughs> there are Donners farming that same land today. The best land under heaven is not California, it's Illinois. That's what they called it. The best land under heaven, Sagamon County. They had it right along. So, um, he had the lawyer about to talk into going with him. Because uh, they had known each other a long time. They had been messmates in the uh, Black Hawk War. Uh, and, and, you know, it soldiered together in that little escapade. And, and uh, the lawyer served him well. But he, he didn't, he wasn't sure. And his wife was dead set against it. She, they had a toddler and she was pregnant with another baby. And, so, uh, uh, in fact, that lawyer always wanted to go to California his whole life, never got there. And uh, he was like Reed. He was a big proponent of railroads, too, and never got there. In fact, after the Donner Party incident, this young attorney was even offered a, a post uh, out in the territories, in Oregon Territory, and, and, and wished he had taken it. But, uh, when the Donner and Reed parties left, that spot that's marked by a marker right there, right by the old state house, it still stands there, down right in the heart of Springfield. Uh, the lawyer was so morose, he went out riding circuit, but his wife, pregnant wife, came down, and they all waved goodbye to the Donners. And as I like to say then, it's probably a good thing because instead of becoming the 16th president of the United States, Mr. Lincoln might have ended up an entree. <laughs> There's some real surprises you'll find in this book, some characters that come up. Old Jim Bridger, oh, lots of folks, but I'll let you discover them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you started your research and go into it just briefly a little bit about that. Okay. Well, well first of all, uh, those of you who have read some of my books know that I've developed this reputation in the literary world as a guy who goes out and finds a supposedly well-known character from history, often the American West, but not as exclusive the American West, like Crockett, who, well, he was in the West of the time. But, and people or places or events that are so wrapped up in myth and legend, and people don't really have the full picture. There's so many contradictions. So this is where research is very important because you've got to unwrap all of that, kind of like a archaeologist and dig through it, and then prove up um, uh, your premise. You know, I you know I was an ink-stained wretch. I was a hardcore uh, journalist for many years. I was a a newspaper reporter. I was a correspondent for Time Life. And like all good correspondence, contrary to popular belief, <laughs> I always got at least three sources. Three sources. I was writing a book about Frank Phillips, oil man, and I had a good juicy story about Phillips, Frank. And it would have really been something. And I thought I had three sources. And before I had one, before I could get to the other, uh, the person 
suddenly died. And when I got to the third, uh, she was totally gone with Alzheimer's. And I didn't tell the story. So, uh, <laughs> research is very seductive also. And, and, and I'm easily seduced by research. And uh, that's where uh, my wife Suzanne comes in. Because uh, she's not. And, and she is there to remind me, don't you think you've done enough research? You know? <laughs> she's, and she's very helpful to me as well, of course. But so I dug into what I would call the standard research sources for anyone doing a, uh, a, a biography of uh, a person or a group of people. And I was in archives from uh, Yale University to Berkeley. And I was in all, uh, of course, I was up and down the actual trail. And I went to, uh, to everything from the Library of Congress, Smithsonian. I, I did all of that due diligence work, which you have to do. But I always look for something more, because there's always something more. And I don't let the f fact that there might have been a lot of books written about somebody um, deter me. I mean, there were a lot of books written about Crockett and Billy the Kid, but I didn't care because I knew that I would find those gems, and I did. And I certainly knew it here because the story had always leaned, um, uh, I thought, the wrong way. But the real payoff in the research came when I met those direct descendants. Nobody had talked to them, and they were incredibly helpful. I've got a, you know, you always get jacket verbs. I get jacket verbs here from all four of these fellows I, I know, and some of them pretty well. Jim Lair and Larry McMurtry and old pal. But the, but the best blurb I have is from William Bill Springer. He's a great grandson of Captain George Donner, and he created the Donner Springer family collection. And in essence, he said in his blurb, don't buy any other book, this is the one. <laughs> but he, he was so incredibly helpful because I saw material that no one had seen. Um, the Orwell uh, Chronicle, uh, there has been a lot found, different things, journals and correspondence, but uh, then too, so much was lost. Um, Tamson Donner, who's another major figure in the story, he religiously kept a journal, and it's gone. You know, uh, things like that. But uh, but those descendants, that was that was a payoff for me. Yes, sir. And the, uh, the number of people that are involved in the Donner Party, how many were in the, in the start of it, and when they were finally found, how many were that? First of all, the party when they started in Springfield and the party out in the Sierras, totally different. What, what you have in Springfield are, is going on all over the country. At the same time, the Breen family up in Iowa is getting ready to come down. Those Thorntons I told you about with their dog, Prince Darko, they're out there. All these people, and where they go to is independence. That's where they gather up. And then they form wagon caravans. And that's what happened to uh, George and Jacob Donner and their family and James Reed. They left with their families and all their hired people. You had to have, you couldn't be dirt poor to do this because you had to have the wherewithal to hire Teamsters, you had cattle, you had all kinds, you know, it was a logistical chore. So that's why I spent a lot of time, no one's ever really researched to talk about the trip from Springfield to Independence. Not even the Donners, nobody does, none of those people, because they don't consider the trip starting until they get to Independence. Well, that little bit I read to you about independence, you get 
a few chapters of what happened, how they got there. People didn't even know the route they took. Every most all the books say that they left uh, Springfield, and what they do, they took a good old existing wagon road down to St. Louis, right? Crossed it, went up to the Missouri. They didn't even go near St. Louis. They did the logical thing. They went due east to the banks of the Mississippi and crossed in the Hannibal. In the morning they crossed, uh, I don't, of course, don't go into this because it's not germane, but it's germane to me because I knew that there's a 12-year-old boy sleeping about three blocks from where those wagons got off. A young printer's devil who became uh, not only one of my home state, Missouri's best writers, but one of the country. And that, of course, was Sam Clemens, Mark Twain. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> <laughs> so by the time they, when they left with these huge wagon trains, people would leave. Uh, they would get be banished. Uh, they'd kick them out because your cattle's going too slow. There would be arguments, disagreements. The same time, people would be joining them. And there was a whole group. Uh, nobody ever talks about those early companions of theirs. They just focus on the final Donner Party. It didn't become the Donner Party until they were almost trapped when George Downer through attrition became the captain. And, and he, to be honest with you, he wasn't a very good one, but it should have been the Reed Party. But you know, as you'll learn when you read the book, it, that would, is impossible at, at that time. Uh, so by the time they they finished, they they had still the Donner and Reed families, uh, uh, at, uh, minus uh, Reed's mother-in-law, the rest of the families and their Teamsters were, were still there, but they had picked up other families along the way. So when they got out there, I'll, I'll just read to you in this aftermath, the last paragraph, I mean the first paragraph from that. It had taken four, this is in April, of 1847. It had taken four relief parties and more than two months to rescue the Downer Party survivors. In the end, 41 people died and 46 survived. Five perished before reaching the Sierra Nevadas. 35 died at the camps or trying to cross the mountains and one died just after reaching the valley. Even the survivors, of course, many of them were scarred physically and mentally. But um, amazingly, um, I find a lot of the children, like those three old gals at, that were at the monument, uh, they were little little girls, and they were just told what to eat. They were starving. And uh, just a bit of detail, when they cut the flesh, they, they cut off little pieces and dried it or, or put it over fire. It looked like jerky. So probably a lot of these kids didn't even know what they were eating. Which brings up another point about cannibalism. If you talk to the Downer descendants, the Breen descendants, the Reed descendants today, their only wish was they would have started it, the cannibalism sooner because more people would have lived. And anyone who has a squeamish about Survival cannibalism. This is what I tell them. I, I usually get somebody who comes up to me and says, Ooh, cannibalism, that whole thing. This was survival cannibalism. They literally, literally had eaten everything. So I say to this, this theoretical person, All right, you tell me what you would do. And they look at me and I said, Here's the deal. You're in. 20 feet of snow, you've got nothing. That lake is frozen over, there's no game, there's nothing, you've eaten all, you've boiled the hides of those oxen and drinking this horrible gelatinous mess. you picked marrow out of all the bones, you've captured mice in the huts and eaten them. Uh, this unbelievably touching scenes, can you imagine cutting the throat of your beloved dog? 
and eating everything, including the paws. You're finally so hungry and it's hypothermia and starvation and delirious that you're actually chewing on ponderosa bark and pine cones with no nutritional value. And right before you are your kids or your children or your babies. And they're, they're dying and you're dying. And you know that in those banks of snow, there's a lot of protein. I, so I say to the person, I don't know about you, but I would pull out my knife and I would save my family and myself. And that's the only logical thing that it could have happened. What was the spark that made you want to pursue this? Uh, back to myth and all that. I, I've been, I started thinking about this Downer Party book years ago when I did a book on the Lincoln Highway, the father road that runs from uh, Times Square to the Golden Gate through 13 states. Even in 1913 it started off. And, uh, uh, and there's a lot of the father road breath. It's not quite as uh, back to seductive as Route 66, but it's a neat road that remains. Uh, but a lot of that follows the California Trail. So I was very familiar, especially through what's now Nebraska along the Platte, and Wyoming, Utah, up below Salt Lake, Nevada, all the way. The Lincoln Highway runs through Downers Pass, down into Sacramento, and on to San Francisco. Uh, so uh, that really, it got me going as well. And then it would just seem like a logical next book because there's another story from the West that I thought the, the true story is always the best story. So that's why I took this on. And, and right now I'm in the process with my agent and editors of picking the next one. And I won't tell you what any of the characters <laughs> But it may be, I will tease you with this, I, the, the leading candidate right now is closer to home. <laughs> Both. <laughs> Both. This year or next year? Oh. It'll take about three years from now, at the most, or at the least, yeah. Anyway, questions? Yes? What was the biggest surprise that you discovered in the research and so forth? Well, one of the big ones is Lincoln. <laughs> Coming across that Lincoln stuff. Um, then, the more I got into it, um, both the, <coughs> the individual stories of both courage in the individual stories of, uh, of, um, of just pure malice and ignorance. You know, there, no one, um, there were, and I'm not going to go into details right here, there were people along the way that died accidentally, or people along the way that were murdered in, in, in this party. Uh, right before they got trapped, two young men, two brother-in-laws, were going out to find some game down in Truckee Meadow before they got into the snow, and one accidentally shot and killed the other, things like that. So contrary to what some people actually believe, they didn't kill people to eat them. They, with an exception, <laughs> with an exception, and that really is, is a very sad story that I'll tell you very briefly. There were two, uh, John Sutter had his big enterprise on the west side of the, uh, of the Sierras, and you'll read about Sutter, where eventually, you know, two years later they found gold, and uh, karma came around because he didn't get anything out of that deal. He was just a pure scoundrel. <laughs> And he had a big uh, workforce there were, uh, of Indians, a lot of Miwok Indians, who were generally enslaved. 
you know, he fed them in a trough. He farmed the young women and girls out to his friends. You know, I just a despicable guy. But he loved, he would, it was hot to get these people over the mountains, all of these so-called pioneers, to sell them land and to make money. Uh, and he did. Uh, well, when people would make it in, this individuals going in to seeking help would make it in. He, he, on one occasion, he sent two, two of his Miwok Indians back with pack mules with supplies. And they ended up being on this party of, of fairly strong immigrants from the Donnery Party who left on their own, and they were determined to get over to save everybody. A party that eventually, not then, became known as the Forlorn Hope, and you'll read about them. Anyway, when all that pack mule food was gone, these Miwoks and everybody's drifting to the store, long story short, they're out of food again. Nobody's died recently. They're already cannibalizing. Uh, so the rationalization was, well, these Indians aren't human beings. So they shot them, field dressed them, and ate them. That's not an end on that note. <laughs> Did I hear you say it took three different parties to come in and to, to try to to, cap, to uh, rescue them? There, well, there were actually four relief parties. Four relief parties. The, the last relief party was kind of a cleanup party and they brought out the last, just one, uh, the last survivor. Uh, a man named Louis Kesberg, he was the last one they brought out. Who, who is generally considered the villain of the story. <laughs> and I, I think he was probably, uh, uh, I don't think I would have liked Kisberg either. He sounds like a real jerk. But I don't, but they, he was made out to be just a human cannibal, you know, gorging on people and killing people and eating them. Yeah, but that didn't happen. Yes, I'm going to make, yes, sir. You, you wrote in your, in, your, in your chapter, Betrayal, a really poignant display of, of how Jim Bridger. Jim Bridger, yeah. Betrayal. Yeah. Wow, just brutal. Yeah. Brutal. Well, I'm, I'm not going to go into that. That's a good story that you'll find in there. Jim Bridger, who uh, was the one of the most famous uh, mountain men, traders and trappers of the American West, let me just put it this way, he did the Donner Party uh, no good. And, uh, and, and he played a big part in their demise, which you'll read about. I am going to go over to the museum shop and sit there, and I will sign books as long as you buy books. <laughs>